Well, it's no surprise uh, that Christianity uh, has uh, an image problem. There are multiple reasons for that. But especially... Uh, when unchurched people have as their primary exposure to the Christian faith, Hollywood's version of Christianity, particularly Hollywood's version of nerdy pastors, priests, and ministers. Think about this. When was the last time you saw a TV show, a sitcom, or a movie? And how was a pastor or priest portrayed? Preachers are often portrayed as self-righteous jerks in most movies or simpletons on TV sitcoms, and they're always old, like really old. Uh, They're often giving cameos for weddings and funerals, and when they do, they usually turn to be some kind of hypocrite, or perhaps they're even the evil villain in the storyline. If they're preaching on TV, they're always asking for money. If they lead a megachurch, they're not only asking for money, they're they're also philandering. And if there's some kind of conflict going on, it's always the rebellious pastor's son or daughter or some very wise, insightful congregant who brings insight to the dummy pastor and maybe even quotes a Bible verse in the process. If they're giving a message, it's boring and everybody's sleeping. And these, these are the ways in which uh, spiritual leaders, pastors, priests, ministers are portrayed in Hollywood. I'm not trying to rag on Hollywood. This is reality. You know I'm not exaggerating. And so today I want us to reflect on a metaphor that God uses for leaders this morning. And he uses this metaphor for all leaders, for prophets, for priests, for kings. And as I, as I identify this metaphor, which you already know, that of shepherd, I shudder because I know all kinds of misunderstandings, misrepresentation, misinformation will stir in our minds. Because even if your home church is a church led by someone who's young and visionary and somebody who's thoughtful and somebody who's engaged, we likely still have in our minds the idea that pastoral ministry or pastoral care is largely caring for the sick and the needy. Which it does, but we tend to narrow that focus. And so this morning I want us to continue in our study of biblical leadership. And I want us to think a little bit about this this image, this, this metaphor. This Anglicized word that comes from French and Latin for shepherd, pastor. So this morning I want to invite you to think a little bit about your stereotypes, your perspectives, your images. And before we do, let me just give a real brief reflection on last week. Last week we talked about biblical leadership. We saw that biblical leadership is first and fundamentally influence. We talked about how leadership, biblical leadership, is primarily a stewardship. It's not something that belongs to the leader. It's something that belongs to God. The gifting the role, the responsibility, the message, the mission, this is of God. And as such, leaders always are first followers. So leadership is influence, leadership is stewardship. We also talked that leadership brings no guarantees. In other words, as a leader, you influence. But as a leader, you do not control. Because you're working with people who have a will. And we talked a bit about that. But as it relates to this image of Shepherd. Metaphors do helpful things for us. When we talk about the church as a family, that's intended to create a a, a mental image, a picture, to help us understand what the nature of the church is. And similarly, so when we talk about someone being sly or cunning as a fox, or we talk about them being slow as a turtle or playful as an otter, or having the morality of an an alley cat, or perhaps being wise as an owl, these metaphors intended to, to help create a picture So what picture do you have when we say shepherd or or pastor? Now, I know there are limits to metaphors. We've all likely heard messages on how sheep are dumb or how shepherds are at the the lowest point of the social ladder. And while there may be truth in these, we don't want to overwork a metaphor. But the metaphor is still intended to tell us something about what biblical leadership is. So the scriptures use this term shepherd in two large domains, two large spheres which are related. And the first one is is to describe God himself as our shepherd. God, our shepherd. So 
the first organizational leader that emerges for us in the scriptures we talked about last week was Moses. And Moses, as it turns out, after his failure in Egypt, he flees to Midian and there becomes literally a shepherd, one who works with sheep. And God calls him to act as a, a human shepherd. And although, although Moses is acting as somewhat of a shepherd before the people, it is really God who is shepherding his people through, Ill, through the wilderness in their time of discipline and in their time of need. Listen to some of these verses from, from Psalm 28. Oh, save your people and bless your heritage. Be their shepherd and carry them forever. Asaph composes and sings a song in Psalm 80, and he says, Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock, you who are enthroned above the cherubim, shine forth before Ephraim and Benjamin, before Manasseh, stir up your might and come and save us. Restore us, O God, let your face shine on us, that we may be saved. In Isaiah 40, a beautiful picture of care and nurture and tenderness. When it speaks of God, he says, He will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms, and he will carry them in his bosom and gently lead them that are with young. And then in Ezekiel, Ezekiel 34, it speaks with, again, great tenderness and care. Very similar to Psalm 23 when he says, For thus says the Lord God, Behold, I, I myself, will search for my sheep, and I will seek them out. As a shepherd seeks out his flock when he is among his sheep that have been scattered, so I will seek out my sheep, and I will rescue them from all the places where they have been scattered on the day of clouds and of darkness. It talks about how he brings us together and feeds us and nurtures for us, nurtures us and leads us to rest. He says, I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep and I myself will make them lie down, declares the Lord our God. This is the image that, that we're given of God. God serving as our shepherd. Now when this image of shepherd is used, there are three dominant functions which shepherds performed. And almost everything a shepherd would do could be categorized or brought under these three domains, these three functions or responsibilities. Shepherds, biblical shepherds, and this was the understanding of the biblical motif, would protect, would provide, and would guide. And so they would protect. They would protect their sheep from prey, from predators, from wolves and from, from hyenas and, and, and from lions. And they would provide provide food, provide water, provide medical care, medical attention when such was needed. And then they would certainly guide them. He would guide them to these places of, of refreshment and of feeding and of rest and of safety and security. Protect, provide, guide. These were the three functions which shepherds engaged in. And this meaning of shepherd was not just exclusively understood as that of care. There was care, but there was more than care. There was danger to this role. There was responsibility to this role. There was accountability. This was a bold, courageous, sacrificial, strong, authoritative position. Yes, there was tenderness and there was care, but it was robust. It was well-rounded. It was something far more complete and whole than just care. And so we come to Psalm 23. We see the Lord as our shepherd. And we see him protecting us. In those valleys of the shadow of death. We see him providing for us as he takes us to quiet pastures and to still waters and to the restoration of our soul. And we see him guiding us as he leads us to these places of replenishment and safety and security. This is what our God does for us. He protects us, he provides for us, and he guides us. And this is how God is described. And of course, as we come to the New Testament, this is how Jesus is described as our good shepherd our chief shepherd. And so this is the image that God gives of himself. But then this image is then transposed upon human leaders. People are then described as shepherds. In Numbers chapter 27, when Moses knows he's coming to the end of his tenure, he's concerned, he's, he's exercised, he's anxious about who will take the people from here. And he's wrestling with God and in Numbers 27, verse 17, it says, Who shall go out before them and come in before them? And who shall lead them out and bring them in, that the congregation of the Lord may not be as sheep that have no shepherd? And then, of course, in the following verses, we find 
that Joshua will be appointed to take the baton of functioning as a human shepherd over the people of Israel. When we come to 2 Samuel chapter 5, this is the first time when the word shepherd is used not just of leader in a, in a general sense, but of kings in specific sense. And here following Saul's leadership, the people are welcoming David into his anointed role as king. And they say, in times past when Saul was king over us, it was you, you who led out and brought in Israel. And the Lord said to you, you shall be shepherd of my people Israel and shall be a prince over Israel. And this term of being a shepherd was then given to people. And of course, the message that was in view here would be that human shepherds would first and foremost follow God, their ultimate shepherd, shepherd, their chief shepherd, but that they would also model and display and depict and live out and would exemplify these, these same qualities of, of protecting, of providing, and of guiding. Modeled by Jesus, the command was then given to New Testament elders in their responsibility. You can read, read about that in 1 Peter chapter 5. And so this responsibility was passed on. And the modeling was in God himself. Biblical leadership always encompasses these three qualities of protect, provide, guide. Leadership involves more than that. Leadership in different settings, in different venues, in different organizations, in different situations will require more than that. But it always involves certainly that. So as we come to a few moments of reflection, and we've been brief here this morning, but as we re reflect with a view to application, with a view to integration, with a view to making this relevant to our own experience, wherever God places us as influencers, I want to invite you to think a bit for a few moments. What might this look like? What might this look like in a business setting? If you find yourself in a marketplace setting in a leadership role. Don't think church pastor because of the stereotypes and the images that you've acquired over the years. Think biblical shepherd. And how might a business leader be able to function as a shepherd whereby they protect the people and the reputation of this organization? Where they provide for the people of this organization, and where they guide the mission of this organization. What would it look like for a parent to embrace these three qualities of protecting their children, of providing for their children, not just in terms of their physical needs and wants, but in terms of truth, and in terms of teaching, and in terms of knowledge, and in terms of discipline? And what would it mean for them to guide their children, to be intentional, not to be passive, not to be letting children run the roost, but to be engaged in guiding them and influencing them. What would it look like for the classroom or the school to don this responsibility? Teachers, faculty, you are shepherds. Protecting, providing, and guiding. Teachers, faculty, you are shepherds. I am a shepherd. We are, we are shepherds here. What would it mean for pastors to function as biblical shepherds where there's protection and provision and guidance. And what would it look like for our civic and provincial and federal leaders to think of their role as stewarding the responsibility of protecting their constituency, their people, of providing for that constituency and guiding that, not just advancing their own personal oftentimes selfish agenda. But what, what, what might that look like? David Anderson, our MP, is a shepherd. Don't think pastor of a church, but he is a shepherd, and that's what God has called him to do, and that's what he's doing wholeheartedly, sacrificially, dangerously at times. He is a shepherd who's very conscientious to the call of God that is on his life. Yes, shepherding involves care. I, I love this image of, of, of God being pictured as one who's carrying a lamb to safety. And that is so helpful and so appropriate, but it 
cannot stop there. It is rich. It is robust. It is bold. It is noble. It's gutsy. It's dangerous. It's sacrificial. This is what shepherds did. And yet this wasn't just a job. This was a character. This was an identity. And if we, if we led like this, try to imagine what our homes, what our churches, what our businesses, what our schools, what our governments would look like. And wouldn't it be a beautiful thing if we stopped with the imagination and we moved this into reality? Let's pray to that and pray with me. Early this morning, our worship team led us in a song I've never heard before called Give Us Your Heart. And in Jeremiah 3.15 it says, And I will give you shepherds after my own heart who will feed you with knowledge and understanding. Father God, thank you for being our shepherd, our good shepherd, our great shepherd, our chief shepherd. Thank you for giving us the Lord Jesus who modeled this perfectly for us. Would you give us your heart, this kind of heart, so that we might be people of influence who lead well, not with our own agenda, but stewarding the very mission of God. Grant that we would protect, provide, and guide, even as you do over us. And for this we are thankful. In Jesus' name, amen.